Good evening, everyone. And let me welcome you to this discussion of Australian climate policy. My name is David Schlossberg. I'm a professor of environmental politics and the co-director of the Sydney Environment Institute here at the University of Sydney. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and their elders past and present. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. And let us remember, especially on nights like this, that this has been a place of learning about the relationship between people and the non-human environment for thousands of years. So as we share our, our perspectives tonight, let us also remember and pay respect to the knowledge that has been embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country, knowledge that includes responses and adaptation to changing environmental and climatic conditions. I'm going to start the proceedings with an obvious statement. Australia's current set of climate policies are some of the weakest, ineffective, unenthusiastic, uninspired uh, in the developed world. There's more dismantling of policy, dismissal of scientists and other experts, threats to doable targets, and proposed centers of obfuscation than real efforts to address the actual challenges of climate change and the inevitable transition to a post-carbon society. But we do have an opportunity right now. The current goal of cutting carbon emissions 5% from 2000 levels by 2020 must be updated and extended before the Paris meeting of the UNFCCC in December. Last month, the government put out a position paper and asked for input and public submissions on goals for a post-2020 policy. Every concerned Australian citizen should learn about the process, participate in discussions, engage experts, and think about the kind of creative and, yes, potentially onerous efforts we should undertake. And no matter our suggestions or opinions, we should speak out and let the government know what the public wants and expects from its proposed policy. Now, key for me is that there's no single answer here but room for a wide variety of ideas, responses, and policies. Climate change is a huge, complex, wicked issue, as political science call it. And there will not be just one magic bullet answer that will solve all of our problems. So just saying we need a higher renewables target or a 60% cut in emissions by 2030 is not enough. A decade ago, Steve Bacala and Rob Sokolow at, at Princeton proposed the idea of climate stabilization wedges. The central idea there is that there's not one single technology or approach that will get us to our target, but that we need a whole suite of approaches. Beyond just the technologies to cut emissions, these pluralistic wedges, this approach applies to the policy realm as well. A climate challenge society needs to implement existing renewable energy technologies, develop new technologies, for energy and storage, be creative in policy initiatives, including carbon pricing, remove subsidies from fossil fuels and fossil fuel-based practices, to implement a whole range of energy efficiency efforts from homes to industry to transport, to focus on the building of more resilient cities and towns to protect forests and landscapes and oceans and reefs. We can tackle carbon emissions and lessen the impacts of climate change while adapting to the impacts that are locked in and transforming the way that we live with the environment that sustains us. But you don't do that with a single policy effort, a single announcement, a single center institute. You do that by engaging the experts, by engaging the public, by thinking creatively about what we can do now and what kind of future we want to live in, implementing wedge after wedge until we construct a viable and workable response to climate change uh, and a more productive and sustainable relationship with the environment in which we're immersed. And that's why we're here tonight. Now, before we get to Senator Milne and other speakers, I want to introduce the Vice Chancellor of the University of Sydney, uh, Dr. Michael Spence, to say a few words of introduction. I also want to thank, uh, to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Spence, not only for his support um, for the Sydney Environment Institute, but also for engaging with staff and students and the public on a range of issues related to the university's own policies around climate and environmental issues. Dr. Spence.
Thank you. I too would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Well, it's not unreasonable to say that climate policy is the policy for our century and beyond. And it's the policy because you cannot think about regional security. You cannot think about food production. You cannot think about human health. You cannot think about so many other areas of human activity and therefore the activity of the university without getting your climate policy right. And so it's a great privilege to be able to welcome you to this event this evening and in particular to be able to praise the work of the um, Environment Institute of the University of Sydney. What we want to do is to harvest the intellectual resources of the university as a whole to help our society meet this extraordinary challenge. And we were talking just before about the change in the landscape in environmental studies. It used to be that there was a lot of grandstanding in this field, that there was a lot of lone profits, that there were a lot of um, people arguing for this or that solution or this or that. Well, we're now at the stage at which people who take this issue seriously realise that we are genuinely going to have to work together. And there's a new mood of just wanting to get something done. And as David said, that's going to involve not one silver bullet, but all the bullets we have, not one range of expertise, but all the experts across the field. And that, of course, is the thinking behind the Sydney Environment Institute. But it's not just solutions in universities, it's bringing them to the real world. And so to have engagement with major political figures who are concerned about this issue, and who are pushing at the forefront of Australian politics to get people to take it seriously is a great privilege for the university. And so it is tremendous this evening to be able to welcome you um, to the university, Senator Milne. Um, and I know everybody is very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. This is the problem of our generation. This is a problem that together we must face together across the disciplines, together between universities and governments, together between universities, governments and industry. And if we do, then there is a real chance that we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spence. So we've got a fairly straightforward plan for the evening. Senator Milne will take about 30 minutes to deliver a policy speech, and then Professors Rosemary Lister and Christopher Wright will offer their own perspectives for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll open the floor to questions which I will moderate, I'm mindful that we have to close uh, at 7.30. Christine Milne is the Australian Greens leader and senator for Tasmania. She's one of Australia's most experienced and respected environmental and community activists with a career spanning 30 years. After leading a highly successful alliance of farmers, fishers, scientists, environmentalists, and concerned community members from Wesley Vale to prevent the construction of a polluting pulp mill, Senator Milne was elected to the Tasmanian parliament in 1989, became the first woman to lead a political party in Tasmania in 1993. She was elected to the Senate in 2004, elected Deputy Leader of the Greens in 2008, and Leader in 2012. In her 10 years in the Australian Senate, Senator Milne further developed her national and international reputation for expertise and passion in policy to address global warming. Her extensive knowledge of climate policy, along with her experience with power-sharing minority governments, informed her role as lead negotiator for the Greens on climate policy. She was an invaluable part of the multi-party climate change committee as it designed the clean energy future package in the previous government. This was a multi-pronged policy approach, including the emissions trading scheme, the biodiversity fund, and 10 billion for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Senator Milne's international reputation was recognized when she was appointed a United Nations Global 500 Laureate and elected Global Vice President of the IUCN from 2005 to 2008. She's held a series of international and senior environmental advisory positions and is recognized as a leader in the green and environmental movements globally. 
And I do want to say something um, that to me is really important. Senator Milne um, was offered the opportunity to just give a policy speech here at the university or to do something like this, to have a format where she would engage with scholars from the Sydney Environment Institute uh, and with you. Uh, and I think it's incredibly admirable uh, that she has chosen to engage with us and engage with you rather than just give a policy speech and be done with it. Um, so uh, we at the Institute uh, are deeply appreciative of this approach and of the Senator and hope that this event serves as a model for future engagement with political figures. But right now, please join me in welcoming Senator Christine Milne. Well, thank you very much for that lovely welcome, and I am delighted to be here. Uh, I acknowledge that we meet here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and in so doing, acknowledge that Australian Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, are already suffering the impacts of global warming. And you will not find, when people talk about we've had a temperature rise of 0.8, they don't, uh, 0 0.8, they don't realise that that's not uniform, that in Central Australia, in the Torres Strait and other places, there is a disproportionate effect on those communities. And it would be ironic if we worked hard to restore title to Aboriginal land and recognition in the Constitution, but drove people from their lands because we failed to act on the climate. But I wanted to mention at the right at the start that we are here at a critical time in the history of our planet and our civilization, globally and locally. Never before has one cohort of people been able to determine what life will be like for every generation and species that comes after us. Local and regional civilizations have been decimated before, from the Euphrates through to Easter Island, uh, to South American uh, contexts but never before on a planetary scale. And that is the power we now possess. That's what makes it the age of the Anthropocene. The key question facing us all is whether the world's political systems nationally and globally through the United Nations are capable of addressing the global emergency facing us all on a scale and in a time frame that gives us a chance of avoiding an unlivable planet. There's almost a complete disconnect between the physical reality of the world that we now live in and the political and economic constructs we've created to govern ourselves. We live on a finite planet with a population set to be 9 billion by 2050. There is a physical limit to the capacity of forests, oceans, rivers and atmospheres to absorb waste while maintaining healthy ecosystems that can sustain life as we know it. There's a physical limit to the extraction and burning of non-renewable fossil fuels if we are to maintain a safe climate. And you might have seen Professor Will Steffen coming out last week saying that the latest research says that 88% of Australia's coal reserves need to stay in the ground for a 50-50 chance of constraining global warming to less than two degrees. But politics and economics actually deny these realities. Instead, we have meeting after meeting of the world's political leaders, and we're all off to Paris again for the 21st meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. For 21 years, we have been talking about this, and when we get to Paris this year, we'll talk about what needs to be done and then find every reason for not doing it. Paris is set against, is set against a backdrop of accelerating global warming. The Totten Glacier in East Antarctica is melting from underneath. When it melts, three and a half metre sea level rise. We don't know when that will occur, but it is already underway. The West Antarctic ice sheet is disintegrating and the retreat of the sea ice in the Amundsen Sea, for example, is irreversible. 
the Arctic ice is thinning and has reached the record lowest winter extent ever. Craters are opening in Siberia as the tundra melts, spewing methane to atmosphere. Recent research is telling us that the thermohaline conveyor is slowing in the Atlantic. And only a few weeks ago, latest research that says the Amazon is slowing in its capacity to absorb carbon dioxide. Extreme weather events are more and more intense with floods, fires, droughts, cyclones, typhoons, heat waves, killing more and more people. The oceans are becoming more acidic and the capacity of microscopic creatures to form shells is diminishing, threatening the marine food chain and at the same time coral reefs are dying. We are living right now in the sixth wave of extinction. It's something we really have to take on board. And all of this with only 0.8 of one degree of warming. But we're on a path to four to six degrees of warming. Tipping points are being reached and they're irreversible. So why would anyone fly like Prime Minister Abbott is doing this week with a briefcase full of notes on how to frustrate action on global warming on the premise that action is not in the national interest. Why indeed? Well, the answer is simple. Whereas it is not in the national interest of people or nations to undermine action, it is in the interests of vested corporations who are making billions in the short term from spewing greenhouse gas emissions to atmosphere. It is in their interests to buy governments with political donations and entrench the revolving door between politics and boardrooms. It's especially so in Australia where there's a disproportionate number of resource-based vested interests. And that's why I've reached the conclusion that we will not win on the climate, here or anywhere, until we take democracy back from these vested interests that have bought it. We are no longer living in a democracy in Australia we are a plutocracy, a political system ruled and dominated by the small minority of wealthy citizens and corporations. That's a shocking thing to say, but from my perspective in Canberra, that is precisely how the government runs. The Abbott government is the wholly owned subsidiary of the coal industry. It's torn down carbon pricing, attacked the renewable energy target, abolished the mining tax, maintained fossil fuel subsidies, attempted to abolish ARENA and the CFC, promoted the return of, of uh, environmental protection powers to the states away from the Commonwealth, promoted the Carmichael coal mine and opening up the whole of the Galilee Basin, promoting CSG, recently approaching Bjorn Lomborg to come to the University of Western Australia dangling a $4 million carrot. And at the same time, running around with Peabody Coal's public relations materials saying coal is good for humanity. So the first thing we need to do to secure serious action on the climate is to restore our democracy by taking back the power for people from corporations. So a prerequisite. <laughs> a prerequisite then for action and a fundamental part of a framework to, to address global warming is political reform. We need proportional representations. We need political donations reform, stronger freedom of information and whistleblower laws, greater transparency in corporate reporting and disclosure, a national ICAC, restored funding to the environmental defenders' offices, a stronger public service not constrained by short-term contracts, we need budgets from a federal government that are internally consistent and designed to deliver planned outcomes on emissions reductions. And at the same time, we need to inspire people with a vision of what's possible, with the idea that the wave of innovation that will be necessary will touch everyone and is a huge opportunity. Just as John F. Kennedy inspired America with his call to put a man on the moon in a decade in the 1960s, we need to inspire Australians now to put all of our collective intelligence, creativity and innovation to work. So I put it to you, let us as a nation secure net carbon zero emissions by 2040. We can do it. 
the average age of Apollo 11's mission control team was 28 years old. The youth were really engaged. They transcended the ordinary limits of human existence on that mission as it was known in 1961. They put that man on the moon and so it needs to be with the climate. So what level of ambition is needed to avoid catastrophic climate change? The world decided in Copenhagen to cap global emissions at a level that wouldn't exceed two degrees. And to achieve that at a 67% probability, the Climate Change Authority tells us our global budget of emissions is 1,700 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent between 2000 and 2050. Now that sounds like a lot, but in the first 12 years of this 50-year budget, we've already used up 36%, making the job we have to do in the out years harder and harder. And that's why, with 67, and that's with 67% probability. What if you were to try for 90% probability of actually securing two degrees? You would have to say we've already run out of the budget. So the Independent Climate Change Authority concluded that Australia's global responsibility should be 1% of that entire budget, which translates to a remaining budget for Australia of 10.1 billion tonnes from 2013 onwards. On our current pollution levels, Australia will use up its entire allocation by 2030, 20 years early. Unlike the government's budget pantomime, this is the real budget emergency that faces Australia. Now, translating this budget into national targets and the gradient of the trajectory to meet the budget is the next critical consideration. And this week, again, the Climate Change Authority has, pl has plotted this trajectory and said that our 2025 target, just 10 years away, has to be 30% below 2000 levels, and our 2030 target has to be 40 to 60% less. But that will not happen if the Labor Party and the Liberal Party stay in furious agreement that our 2020 target should just be 5% below 2000 levels, meaning an additional gap of 25% would have to be uh, actually made in five years. Now, frankly, that is unachievable with our current political settings. It's very poor foresight, very selfish, and it's really frustrating because we've known since the Stern review in 2006 that an early planned tr transition is so much cheaper than radical dislocation later. Each year that we delay is a direct transfer of a greater and greater burden on future generations. You've heard Joe Hockey talk about intergenerational theft. Well, I say what the Abbott government is doing now on the climate is a classic case of intergenerational theft on a grand scale. <laughs> Ironically, history will show that the people doing the most to delay action now are the ones who are undermining our economic system and our way of life into the future. And while I'm proud to have been part of establishing the Climate Change Authority and its solid contributions to informed public debate about our national aspirations to prevent global warming, the Greens do, with great respect, take issue with some of their underlying assumptions. We don't challenge the scientific data that sits behind their work, but we do challenge the level of probability we're aiming at to avoid tipping points which trigger dangerous feedback loops in our climate system. The work of the Climate Change Authority is based on achieving a 67% chance of avoiding runaway global warming. The Greens want targets that would provide a 75% chance of stabilising global temperatures at 2 degrees and a 50-50 chance of stabilising at 1.5 degrees. Now, this is especially so because the latest science and the, li and the late likelihood is that the IPCC will reduce the carbon budget even further. And they will do so not only because of the science, but also in the political sense that the small island states, the least developed countries, are the ones pushing for a gro global agreement that is set at 1.5 because they recognise that they are the countries set to drown, and effectively that is already happening in some of those small island states. 
So we've got a situation where the science is hardening, the maths need recalculation, and that's why we should err on the side of fast and dramatic action now. Now, the Climate Change Authority also based their targets on what they considered was Australia's fair share of the global pollution budget, and they said that was 1% of global emissions. Now, this is down from the 1.3% it is now. And I would ask, why would any other country accept that it is Australia's fair share at a time when we are pushing fossil fuels on the rest of the world? Why would anyone accept a 1% contribution as being enough for a rich nation like ours, especially as we're the world's highest emitter on a per capita basis? On a per capita basis, every Australian is responsible for 26.6 tonnes. It's eight in the UK. We are three times the emitter that they are. We are, as a population, just 0.3% of that global population, but we are the 13th biggest polluter out of 247 countries. And add to that that four-fifths of the coal we dig up here is exported to other countries where it ends up on our customers' greenhouse balance sheets. If we owned up to these harmful products that we're pushing, then by 2020 our sparsely populated continent would be responsible for 4% of global emissions. We've got a huge responsibility to do our fair share. And the rest of the world is starting to ask serious questions. And if you might have had a chance to see in this last week following the uh, assessment of the reports that have gone in on people's targets, the, the EU, the United States, China, all France, all asking questions of the adequacy of Australia's targets, asking what is the difference between direct action and the emissions trading scheme that was there. How does Australia justify the claims it is making? Are they going to use the, the land use, land use change and forestry provisions again to their effect? So nobody is taking us seriously. And a final component in setting targets is based on the international principles of historical responsibility and ability to finance our contributions. Well, given that a great proportion of our historical and current wealth is derived from emissions intensive activities, and the export of fossil fuels, and the fact that we're a wealthy nation well equipped to leverage the opportunities of a new low carbon global economy, we have to do more. And so for this reason, we've got, we want a 75% probability of achieving two degrees, if not 1.5. We've got a small population and a high per capita emissions rate. We've got big historical responsibility and we do have the human resource capacity to act. And so that's why the Greens are now announcing much more ambitious targets. So to lift our ambition in this crucial global contract and to provide enormous economic opportunities to new industry and innovators, the Greens' post-2020 targets are for 40 to 50% by 2025, that's 10 years away, halving our emissions on 2000 levels by 2025, 60 to 80% by 2030, and taking us on a steady trajectory to reach net zero pollution by 2040. This next decade is the decade for heavy lifting. These targets are achievable. Already we're seeing other nations submit their targets. Their aspirations have to be compiled and analysed in preparation for the Paris summit to see whether each individual's country proposals, when added together, meet the global budget. And I can tell you now, they won't. There's no doubt about that. Australia has signalled it will announce its post-2020 targets about the time of the UN meeting in Bonn in June. And when this occurs, be ready for all the accounting trickery that Australia is capable of. You all know about the Kyoto, the, the Australia clause in the uh, Kyoto, first Kyoto Agreement where we got an increase in our emissions on 8% on the basis of halting land clearing when the government already knew that Peter Beattie's Queensland had already announced that they would do that. And when the government does eventually announce its post-2020 target, there will be more tricks. Firstly, they'll move the baseline year. Up until now, the baseline year is 2000. Australia will suddenly decide that we're going to compare it with 2005. Why? Because 2005 was the year of our maximum emissions. 
so comparing a 2020 target to 2005 makes it look much bigger. So five goes to 13 at the stroke of a pen. Secondly, they'll repeat what the Labor government did by offering a range based on conditions being satisfied. But the point is they will never agree that those conditions are ever satisfied. Now, if you remember, the conditions Australia laid down, 5% and up to 25 if conditions were met, well, they were met. They have been met post Cancun, but Australia has never conceded it. And so any talk higher than 5% has been completely rejected by the media and by both the major parties. And that is a real deceit on the population. Now, whilst the Greens' targets are ambitious, 40 to 50 per cent by 2025, 60 to 80 by 2030, and net carbon zero by 2040, they are achievable and they're essential. We spend billions on foreign wars, allegedly to keep Australia safe, when the greatest challenge to our security and to our well-being is runaway global warming. That is where we should be investing in Australia right now. Now it's not a tale. Thank you. It's not a tale of woe laden with costs and job cutting and heartache, as the Minerals Council of Australia and the Echo Chamber and the Murdoch Press will tell you. Rapidly decarbonising our society is a huge opportunity, and it's an opportunity to address the things we don't like about the way we live. Nobody likes pollution and the health impacts associated with it. Nobody likes sitting in traffic for hours and hours in congestion. Nobody likes the fact that our community is full of anxiety, our community is worried sick about the future. We can replace what we've got with what we want and the jobs to go with it because, as you heard the Vice-Chancellor say earlier, it's going to take everyone. We can rethink every system we have got because we need to, and in doing so, we can bring this incredible innovation and imagination that people have got to those problems. Business as usual is over. This is like the opportunity to draw a line under it and say, right, now we can do it differently. If we could do it differently, how would we do it? So it's not just about having a goal, it's you have to have a pathway to get there, and the Greens have got exactly that. And we've got a pathway that will not only lead to emissions reductions, but more resilient ecosystems that protect our fresh water, our plants, our animals, forests, reefs, wetlands, rivers. These things give us fresh water. They give us uncontaminated soil. They give us clean air. Plus, a future thinking about it like this means you'd get better educated, healthier, happier, more productive, people, connected jobs. You've got a community coming together to face a huge challenge. Now, what's not to love about that? Instead of isolated people worrying themselves sick about the way they're living and anxious about the future, people embracing a goal and coming together. Now, the Greens' pathway to achieve our targets are best looked at if you break it down into where our biggest levels of pollution are. And of course, 50% currently of our em emissions come from the energy sector. So that's obviously where you would start. It's where you can make the most gains fastest. So the first thing is you'd keep the renewable energy target as it is, 41,000 gigawatt hours by 2020. This would deliver 26 to 28 per cent of Australia's energy as renewable and lift, we should go to 100 per cent renewable energy by 2030. And that, as that, all that new renewable energy comes online, you can take more and more out of the old coal generation, take it offline. And with such a staged and planned transition, you can go from the coal jobs of the last century to the 21st century jobs of the future. And already, solar jobs outnumber coal jobs across Australia. The renewable, the revolution, the energy revolution has actually been won. It's been won by the renewables and within the renewables, solar has won that race. We can immediately close down 9,000 megawatts of coal-fired power that the uh, energy in operator has said we don't even need. The Greens have a plan to remove our most polluting and redundant coal power stations, Hazelwood and Alcoa's Anglesey in Victoria, Clyde and Stanwell in Queensland, Liddell and Walla Warang in New South Wales, 
All of that is possible now and it won't make a difference to the security of the energy system. We support an emissions trading scheme as well, which would send an economy-wide price signal to drive investment towards cleaner activities and away from dirtier ones. But on its own, an ETS is not a panacea. And please, when you hear the words emissions trading scheme, do not believe it is code for action on the climate. It is only a tool, and its effectiveness depends on the severity of the cap for a start, the level of exemptions and free permits associated with it, and of course, thirdly, the extent to which it drives change at home and the extent to which it is limited in the capacity to buy overseas permits. So when you hear people say, oh, I believe in climate action and it has to be an emissions trading scheme, just recognise that that is a political statement that needs unpacking. We need to reform the national electricity market. It was designed for a previous era. It is broken. We need a national electricity market which has an environmental objective up front that the role of the electricity market is to facilitate the emissions reduction that we have set down in global treaties. Also, we have to stop new coal mines, new coal seam gas. The fastest growing area of emissions is fugitive emissions from these fossil fuels. And we can do that and we can end fossil fuel subsidies and we can put a $2 levy on the export coal that goes out of this country and put it into a national disaster resilience fund which would enable funds to be put up front for adaptation now and to help fund the response to disasters later. Divestment is something that we can all be engaged in and I really congratulate uh, the university for the work it's done. ANU's divestment caused a bit of a stir to start with, but it's already paid off because some of those uh, uh, companies that they've gotten out of have done very badly since, so it's been a good divestment policy financially as well as socially. And, of course, I'm aware uh, here as well at the University of Sydney there is work going on in terms of divestment. We need that to be the same with the Future Fund, for example. In terms of energy efficiency, we need a national energy efficiency target and a white certificate scheme so that we get the built environment to change so that it's a healthy built environment but one that reduces emissions, one that has better amenity for the people who work in it and, of course, all the jobs, whether it's in architecture, urban design and planning. Public transport is, of course, another major area because this is a big area of emissions um, that we have and if with such low interest rates at the moment, it's a perfect time for governments to borrow and invest in massive public transport around the country and especially high-speed rail actually linking uh, the states. That would make a massive difference. But so too in our landscape. We have to stop logging native forests. Our native forests are massive carbon stores they have fantastic biodiversity, but knocking them down makes no sense whatsoever. We need to protect carbon in the landscape and make sure we do that uh, as a matter of regulation. This will take everything, not just emissions trading, not just regulation. There will need to be financial incentives. You need the whole package of tools to bring about the changes that we so desperately need. We also have to recognise that it's up to governments in their procurement policies, and President Obama has just done this recently, with his procurement policies to go out there and say, OK, we need to use the government money to get energy productivity retrofits in buildings, to contract renewable energy projects, to lift vehicle fuel efficiency standards. And I've had legislation in the Senate to legislate Australia into the highest fuel efficiency standards to meet those in the EU, and that would immediately start to bring down emissions. That is, of course, before we have the massive rollout of public transport, as I said, but also electric vehicles. The thing that I think is amazing in my lifetime, I never imagined really we would get to a point where electricity and petrol were two things that, were, that went from being fixed costs in a budget to potentially generators of cash for, for uh, families. If you can imagine, we've gone from cars being a cost to cars in an electric vehicle system going from being a transport 
uh, component to being an energy component, where electric cars can, dis can download their batteries at the time of highest peak and shave off the peak in your electricity system. I mean, these are extraordinary changes. Where you go from a household, where you used to have no choice and now you do, and of course, battery technology is going to be the massive game changer in terms of enabling people with their solar panels on their roof, their own battery, their battery in the car, they are away. They are able to do what they want to do. Now, in terms of where we go from here, there are all those things to be legislated. It might seem arduous and overwhelming, but actually it's exciting. And Australia is really well positioned to be able to do this. We're smart, we've got great natural resources with renewable energy, we've got a fantastic commitment from Australia's youth to get on with this. We need to invest in education. That is essentially absolutely the basis of a low carbon to zero carbon economy. It means harnessing people's brains to get the change that we need. We know what's at stake with global warming. We've got the courage to say what needs to be done. We've got the support and the focus of the generation who understand what's up for it. And I just want to conclude by saying, the Stone Age did not end for the lack of stone, and nor will the fossil fuel age end for the lack of fossil fuels. A political rethink is necessary. Those institutions, including political parties, based on the vested interests of the past, are not capable of delivering the changes that are necessary. And that's where the Greens come in. The future is here. Let's embrace it. Let's rise to the challenge. Let's walk out of here tonight and say, net carbon zero 2040, here we come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Milne. Um, before we get to questions, of course, we're going to have a couple of uh, sort of contextual talks and uh, responses from two of our professors at the Institute. Uh, Prof professor Rosemary Lister will speak first. Uh, she's Professor of Climate and Environmental Law in the Faculty of Law. She's also the director of the faculty's Australian Center for Climate and Environmental Law. In 2013, Rosemary was appointed a Herbert Smith Freehall's visiting professor at Cambridge Law School and was visiting scholar at Trinity College, Cambridge in 2009 and 2014. In the area of environmental law, Rosemary specializes in energy and climate law, climate disaster law, and water law. She's published two books with Cambridge University Press in the area of energy and climate law, and in October this year, her new monograph, Climate Justice and Disaster Law, will be published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, after Rosemary, Professor Christopher Wright will speak. Chris is Professor of Organizational Studies and leader of the Balanced Enterprise Research Network at the University of Sydney Business School and the Sydney Environment Institute. His research focuses on the diffusion of management knowledge, managerial, managerial and occupational identity, consultancy, and organizational and workplace change. His current research explores individual, organizational, and societal responses to climate change. He's particularly interested in how managers and business organizations interpret and respond to climate change and has published on this topic in relation to issues of corporate citizenship, emotionology, organizational justification and compromise, risk, narrative identity, and future imaginings. He also has a book forthcoming with Cambridge University Press on climate change, capitalism, and corporations, processes of creative self-destruction. And then after Chris, all three speakers uh, will come up uh, on the stage and we'll have uh, some Q&A. So Rosemary, to you. Thanks very much, David. And I would like to thank Senator Milne for sharing her vision with us this evening. We were talking earlier and Senator Milne said that she's been going to COP since COP4 and to still have so much passion um, after such a long time of disappointments. Uh, it's a bit like being on a roller coaster. So thank you very much for your thoughts uh, this evening. 
My first uh, engagement with climate change was uh, in 1997. And for the first 12 years of my academic career, I worked only in the area of energy and climate law. And in 2010, I moved my research entirely into the area of climate disaster law. So I'm looking this evening at what does a, dis a responsible and integrated climate policy look like. And like Senator Milne, I think that mitigation is only part of the, of the answer. So what I'm going to look at is a couple of factors which I think need to all work together. The first and most obvious is acceptance by the government of the scientific consensus of, on climate change and the establishment of publicly funded climate science agencies. So for example, Obama in 2014 provided a budget of 2.7 billion through a 13 agency collaborative US global change research program um, engaging in climate change communication, risk and catastrophe modeling, and developing tools to assist decision making. And this body produced the 2014 US National Climate Assessment, which looks at the key climate change um, impacts on the US, as well as every region of the US, as well as the impacts on every single aspect of the economy. And following on from this, the US Government Accountability Office, which has oversight of congressional spending, was able to publish its high-risk series, an update which identifies climate change as a key financial risk to the economy. In the EU, we see that it has established Horizon 2020 with a budget of almost 80 billion euro to boost top-level research in Europe, including for the European Research Council to help address major societal challenges like climate change, the development of sustainable transport, and making renewable energy more affordable. So we need publicly funded climate change research. We need effective greenhouse gas mitigation targets and incentives for the green economy. The IPCC fifth assessment report said that if we are to achieve that 2% goal, then greenhouse gas emissions must be 40 to 70% lower in 2050 compared with 2010 levels, that's globally, and near zero by 2100. And to achieve this, all countries must immediately reduce emissions, including by adopting a single carbon price. So these are just an indication of what some jurisdictions have put up as their intended nationally determined contributions for, for Paris. The EU, a 40% reduction by 2030 compared with 1990 and 80 to 95 by 2050. It currently has a 20% renewable energy target, a 20% energy efficiency target, and in its strategy for 2020, its economic strategy, it's transitioning to a green economy with thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs on offer and to strive towards an absolute decoupling of economic growth and environmental degradation. A major fossil fuel economy, the US, its target is 26 to 28% below 2005 levels by 2025 and 80% below by 2050. Moving now to climate change adaptation, on the 1st of November 2013, Obama published an executive order which he called preparing the United States for the impacts of climate change and he established the Council on Climate Preparedness and Resilience comprising at least 30 government agencies to ensure that there would be an integrated federal government strategy to deal with climate change. And by 2014, every single US federal government agency had prepared an adaptation strategy. Similarly, in the EU, in 2013, the European Commission adopted its 2013 EU strategy on adaptation to climate change, whereby every single country in the EU is obliged now to, de to develop its adaptation strategy. We need also now to acknowledge the fact that we're in the era of climate disasters and catastrophes, so we need cohesive national policies for response, recovery, rebuilding, and risk transfer. In other words, compensating victims. So on the 13th of 16th of December 2013, the European Council adopted a new 
EU-wide Union Civil Protection Mechanism to provide a high level of protection against disasters by preventing or reducing their impacts through adaptation, developing a culture of prevention and improving cooperation between civil protection and other relevant services, enhancing all countries' preparedness in responding to disasters, facilitating rapid and efficient responses in the event of actual or imminent disasters, and increasing public awareness and preparedness for disasters, including all climate disasters. It also released its green paper on the insurance of natural and man-made um, disasters, which accompanies its adaptation strategy. And this is to deal with the question of risk transfer and who bears the risks of climate disasters. Following Hurricane Katrina, we see this coming down to the city level, where in 2013, New York City developed its major disaster and adaptation strategy, a stronger, more resilient New York, which includes chapters on coastal protection, buildings, insurance, all of the major utilities, liquid fuels, healthcare, telecommunications, transportation, parks, water and wastewater, as well as community rebuilding and resiliency plans. And this required the passage of 21 pieces of building code legislation to ensure that the city is more resilient to future disasters like Hurricane Sandy. We then have to acknowledge the climate disasters in the least developed countries and small island developing states, but before that, acknowledging that under the UNFCCC, all developed countries have agreed to commit $100 billion a year by 2020 to help developing countries with mitigation and adaptation, equal amounts of funding for both, and now also looking at the fact that developed countries are going to be having to help the least developed countries with the loss and damage occasioned by climate disasters. Unfortunately, the Green Climate Fund reported at the Lima conference that so far it has only received 10.2 billion from contributing parties. So essentially, all of the funding mechanisms for mitigation and adaptation are way behind the kinds of commitments that developing countries need in order to prepare themselves for the un oncoming climate disasters. So since I only have 10 minutes, the quick wrap up, it is not responsible for a government to abolish the Climate Commission slash the funding of climate change research agencies like the CSIRO, threaten university research funding while providing $4 million to Lomborg's consensus center, create a culture of fear and intimidation within government agencies and researchers, including university researchers, over the use of the term climate change, establishing a weak emissions reduction target and abolishing the carbon price mechanism in favor of a voluntary government subsidy scheme. Fail to provide federal government leadership on climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, and to stall on all prior policy development in this area. To abandon previous Labour government efforts to deal with climate disasters and insurance and risk transfer for those disasters, and to cut Australia's overseas development aid budget to developing countries by 7.6 billion in the face of escalating climate disasters in developing countries. And that's uh, just to let you know that all of the research which I've done recently is to see what other countries around the world, including countries in Southeast Asia, China and so on are doing. And Australia is way behind most other countries in the world in all of these aspects. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, I've been asked to respond to Senator Milne's excellent address upon the question, what role should business play in effective climate change response? Now, if you'd asked me this question eight years ago, 
you probably would have got a very different answer. Back in 2007, like a lot of people, I'd become increasingly aware of climate change. I'd watched Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. Uh, I'd read Nicholas Stern's report. And in the middle of the millennial drought, it seemed quite evident the ground under our feet was shifting fundamentally. Against this background, I began a research project uh, exploring Australian business responses to climate change. Uh, along with some colleagues, we, we studied a range of major corporations focused on this issue. Um, these included an energy company that was anticipating the pricing of carbon emissions as an inevitability, uh, a manufacturer exploring ways to reduce its waste and energy consumption, and banks and insurers um, who were focusing on the financial risks of increasingly extreme weather events. Following the Stern report, it seemed even conventional economics had grasped the logic of climate science and how our reliance on fossil fuels was unsustainable. Major change in the very nature of business seemed not only likely, but inevitable. And yet, as we've heard tonight, how wrong I was. Here we are in 2015 with our Prime Minister proclaiming, as we've heard tonight, coal is good for humanity, with amongst the highest per capita carbon emissions in the world, and the dubious distinction of being the first nation to have repealed a carbon pricing mechanism. So what happened over the last eight years? Well, in a nutshell, the global fossil fuel industry and its political allies successfully sowed the seeds of doubt about climate science across large portions of the Western populace. The power of fossil fuel and mining interests in shaping climate policy has been particularly evident in Australia. Uh, whereas Clive Hamilton and Guy Pearce have argued the so-called greenhouse mafia of corporate lobbyists was central to our national intransigence to climate action. The story of the rise of organised climate change denial is well documented both here and you know, overseas. And its success is evident in changing public opinion and the weak political engagement on climate action we see today. While the endorsement of the Kyoto Protocol under the Rudd Labor government and the eventual adoption of carbon pricing under the minority Gillard government saw some limited reversal of this trend, as Senator Milne um, has noted, with the return of a conservative government, we are now back in the fossil fuel dark ages. This collapse of political will, of course, has nothing to do with climate science. As Professor Andrew Hoffman from the University of Michigan notes, the public debate around climate change is no longer about science, it's about values, culture and ideology. Indeed, over those last eight years, the science has become even more forthright in its urgency. Last year's worst case scenario has become our best case. And we've witnessed a procession of extreme weather events and shifts of such magnitude that they seem more like science fiction than reality. As Senator Milner's noted tonight, if the melting Arctic and the methane venting from a warming Siberian tundra weren't enough, then the announcement last year by glaciologists of the unstoppable collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet and multiple metre rises in sea levels certainly focuses one's attention. To date, the business response to climate change appears to have gone into reverse. We have embraced a fossil fuels forever imaginary in which our traditional reliance on the extraction, export and use of coal, oil and gas continues unabated. Indeed, we're accelerating. The business community's vision appears limited to very much business as usual, only more so. Of course, it's unfair to characterise Australian business as uniform uh, in its response to climate change. As I noted earlier, many prominent companies have not only highlighted the importance of climate science, but also implemented practices to try and reduce their own climate impact. Initiatives such as the Australian Business Roundtable on Climate Change, begun in the mid-2000s by the then CEOs of companies like Westpac, Insurance Australia Group, Visi and Origin Energy, advocated for government action, urgent government action on emissions reduction. Added to this, new innovative companies uh, are emerging, like the US electric vehicle manufacturer Tesla, um, challenging the traditional fossil fuel mindset and looking to a new greener economy driven by renewable energy. Indeed, the business case, so-called, for acting on climate change is not a hard one to make. 
is readily frameable in the language of physical, reputational, regulatory and market risk. It's about reducing costs through more efficient operations and energy usage. It's about reducing waste. It's about attracting and retaining employees who are passionate about the environment and the world we will leave behind for our children. But corporate environmentalism on its own is not enough. We cannot rely on progressive businesses seeing the light on climate and reforming their activities. At best, we will end up with islands of excellence in a sea of mediocrity. In fact, making your business more eco-efficient doesn't necessarily improve environmental outcomes as businesses aim to grow markets and expand consumption. So being a little less unsustainable is not the same as being sustainable. Moreover, I'd argue it's extremely dangerous to assume market mechanisms and corporate capitalism are the answer to the climate crisis. In an age of neoliberalism, we seem to have forgotten that markets are good servants but very poor masters. It might seem unfashionable, but in responding to the scale of the climate crisis we now face, we will likely need government regulation of carbon emissions of a potentially punitive kind. As Senator Milne has pointed out, the science is unequivocal. To avoid exceeding global warming of two degrees Celsius this century, we must limit ourselves to a defined budget of carbon emissions. As we've heard, unfortunately, no known fossil fuel reserves exceed this budget by a factor of five. For Australia, this means that to avoid dangerous climate change, around 90% of our fossil fuel reserves need to stay in the ground. So what should business be doing? Firstly, the implications of climate change for business are not just an economic issue. They extend to the role of business in modern society and questions of ethical leadership. For those firms and industries most centrally involved in the production, export and use of fossil fuels, the moral implications of climate change couldn't be clearer. As environmentalist Bill McKibben has pointed out, if it's wrong to wreck the climate, it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. Secondly, the business community needs to develop a far more constructive approach to the climate crisis. Responding to climate change requires system-wide mobilisation, guided by government and involving all stakeholders. This means business needs to move beyond its traditional lowest common denominator approach in lobbying government on emissions reduction and renewable energy targets and accept the need for fundamental regulatory change. Thirdly, while corporations underpin our escalating carbon emissions, they are also a key source of innovation necessary for the decarbonisation of our economy. This means businesses need to get serious about capacity building for the economic transformation from fossil fuels to renewable energy. They need to approach the physical market and other risks climate change poses with the same seriousness they devote to quarterly sales and profits forecasts. This is not only about risk minimisation, but also identifying the opportunities that can flow from genuine green growth. So to wrap up, climate change is the greatest challenge we will face this century. We urgently need business leaders who understand the climate crisis and its profound consequences. Of course, given such a grim future, it's easier to ignore the threat and live in the moment in our comfortable, affluent society. However, there is also something uplifting in recognising the scale of the challenge we now face. As Al Gore has argued, and I'm quoting him here, we should feel a sense of joy that those of us alive today have a rare privilege that few generations in history have known, the chance to undertake an historic mission worthy of our best efforts. It should be seen as an honour to live in a time when the future of human civilization will be shaped forever by what we do now. Thank you. Well, we've run out of time. I just want to thank uh, everyone for coming. I want to thank Senator Milne for taking uh, the time and the opportunity to uh, engage with folks. Uh, the, my colleagues at the Sydney Environment Institute and the incredible staff at the Sydney Environment Institute, Senator Milne's staff, the Vice Chancellor's staff uh, as well. And I just want to say in closing that we do have, I mean, there's a lot going on. There are a lot of policies to talk about. There are a lot of these wedges that I mentioned before. But what we've got going on right now and what Senator Milne was talking about was a very specific policy that the government is going to develop over the next few weeks to bring to Paris. 
And that's the pressure uh, that folks need to put on the government at this point. So thanks again for coming. Thanks for participating. And we look forward to seeing you again.